small yeah. ones over carbon. Yeah, like the bigger ones are like pretty fresh. When, when you get the bigger one, you're like, <laughs> yeah. doesn't happen another time. Um, okay, I guess. Nobody waiting outside? No? No? Okay. Cool. Um, so I guess we can go with the next speaker. So Donald is here. Again, and let's go. Hello, so um, here we're going to talk about testing in Rust, but specifically with a focus on mocking. So just a little bit about me, um, I'm a software engineer that works for a quant hedge fund called Engineers Gate, and my time is split between building real-time low latency um, trading systems and also scalable data infrastructure. So I'm primarily a Python, C++ and Rust developer, although one day I'm hoping to kind of scratch out C++ and just replace that with Rust, as I'm sure many people here are. Um, so the motivation for this talk is that Rust focuses on safety on memory safety, on safety when running concurrent applications. And it does a great job at this without compromising on ease of use of, of APIs and whatnot. But even if our code is safe, we still need to make sure that it's doing the logically correct thing. So what we're going to cover here is an extremely brief introduction to running unit tests in Rust, then about running behavior verification tests in Rust using a crate called double. And then we're going to talk about some design considerations, because actually generating mock implementations in Rust is particularly challenging because it's a statically typed compiled language, and the borrow checker makes things even more difficult. So unit tests. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, ever actually wrote any kind of Rust before, um, you create a library with um, Rust package management tool, Cargo, Cargo New. Um, when you create a library, for example, some lib, uh, it generates this single source file, and this contains this bit of code here which is just an empty test case. So if we had some production code, say in this lib.rs file, here we have, say, add to, it's just add to to an integer, um, we can write tests for this function by defining a private test module in the same source file and then annotating it with CFG test, which tells Cargo to only build this code in the test build, not in the production binary. Um, then you write various test functions inside and you annotate in each individual test with test, and then when you run cargo test, it builds all the production code, builds the test code, and actually runs all of those test functions. Rust has native support for documentation tests, so running tests in that are actually example code that are in, is in your documentation to make sure your example code and your, um, your library don't actually misalign, uh, as well as integration tests. But again, the focus here is on unit tests and mocking. So the motivation behind mocking is that if you imagine any, any software system, you know, it's basically a DAG of um, various components. And if we wanted to test one of these components, you know, we have many, many dependencies, or may have many dependencies. Um, in this case, this top-level component that's highlighted in red, if we were to test this, um, we have to actually construct, instantiate, and configure all three of their dependencies, and then their dependencies as well. So suddenly, if you just wanted to test like five lines of code, suddenly you're writing dozens, if not hundreds, of lines of setup code. So the solution to this is to simply mock out um, or create fake implementations of the direct dependencies to simplify the actual overall test fixture itself. Um, we typically eliminate anything that's non-deterministic that can't be reliably controlled in a unit test, data sources, network connections, potentially libraries that have global state um, or something, some horrible library that you end up using. Um, and you can also eliminate large internal dependencies as well. Um, there's advantages and, and disadvantages to doing that, but if you've got particularly large, um, complex dependencies that take a long time to set up, you can eliminate those as well. So the solution to this is to use the test double, and that kind of comes from the notion of a stunt double in films. Um, and I'm surprised he actually managed to get away with being the stunt double of Brad Pitt. Um, so uh, a test double is basically a replacement for any actual real production code that behaves the same way, but is easier to set up. And there are many types, but most people just refer to all of these doubles as mocks. Um, in this case, what we're actually covering is spies, which is a specific type that um, you can configure to behave in different ways, but it also records all the interaction that the code on the test has with it, all the times it was called and what it was called with. And what this is called is behavior verification, which is a style of unit testing. It's a style of writing tests by testing the code, by asserting on its interaction with its collaborators or its dependencies. So in Rust, we can generate um, testables in a variety of ways. Two ways of doing this, um, with the double crate, for example, is by generating mock implementations of traits and also generating mock functions as well. And you can configure, flexibly configure the, uh, the various behavior, what it returns, does it run a function, does it error, as well as simple but also quite nuanced assertions about how it was called and how it was used. So 
classic example um, in the kind of field I work in is uh, let's say we were trying to predict the profit of a stock portfolio over time. Now, imagine we have some traits called profit model. Um, this has one method, profit at, which takes some timestamp and then we'll return the profit at that given timestamp. We have a function called predict profit over time, whose goal is to generate a time series of profits. So we give it a start and end time series, um, the model itself, which can be any model, um, and then we simply iterate through, that, through all of the individual timestamps, generating the profit of that timestamp and then returning a vector of the profits. And we want to test this function. Simple function, but for illustration purposes, let's test it. So recall that our test should be repeatable and not rely on an external environment. However, this is very challenging in this case because the profit model is a very complex beast. Um, predicting profit is really hard. So real implementations actually use a lot of different data sources um, and a lot of very complex mathematical models. So if you just want to test this simple basic code here, you probably don't want to have this ginormous setup of what is extremely complex proprietary code. So we mock it. And in Rust, we do this with two macros. The first is mock trait. So mock trait generates a struct that has a bunch of boilerplate and bookkeeping inside it to keep track of what, how it's been called and how it hasn't. So in this case, we have this trait we call mock trait. This is the name of our mock struct. And then we list the methods in the trait that we're mocking so it generates the right boilerplate code internally. Then we have to explicitly tell the Rust compiler to, to, to that the mock model implements the profit model trait. So we have import profit model for mock model. And then we have the mock method macro inside it, which again will generate the actual real profit app function, which calls our internal struct. And so that's the kind of like, that's all the code you need to generate a mock that has all the features that I'm about to explain. So actually using this, if you imagine you wanted to just say run through three timestamps and assert that the profit over time, the time series it generated was correct, and that the profit model was used in the correct manner. Um, we instantiate the mock by doing mock model default, which just creates a default initialized mock model. We say profit at return value 10. Um, and then this thing will, the profit at foot method will just keep returning 10. So we see that the actual time series it returns is 10, 10, 10. And we can make assertions at the end of the test how the mock was called. So in this case, profit at dot num calls is 3. And there's various ways you can set mock behavior. If you don't specify anything, it just uses the default value of the return type. We can set a single return value for all calls like we did before. We can set a sequence of return values, like 1, 5, 10. Um, we can set return values for specific arguments. So we can say, for timestamp 1, return this. Otherwise, do some other default behavior. In this case, return 0. Um, and we can even use arbitrary functions as well, or closures. And the benefit of doing it like this, as opposed to just writing a mock implementation that has that code in, like manually writing a mock implementation, is that in this way, you get all the boilerplate code generated so you can do these types of assertions that I'm about to discuss. So um, once you've configured the mock and how it's supposed to behave, you want to assert that it was used as expected. It was called the right number of times and had the right arguments. Now, there's fairly loose assertion, so you can say the mock was called at least once, it was called with one, and it, or it was called with timestamp one and also timestamp zero. But often you actually want to tighten your call assertion. So you might want to say, not only do you care that it was called with one and zero, um, but you also care that it never had any more calls than that. So it has calls exactly one, zero, two, which is, will pass because in this case, we're passing timestamp zero to two, inclusive. Um, and then um, you can even say it has calls exactly in order. And it's kind of up to you how tight you want to make your assertions or loose. Um, and that's something I'm going to discuss in a second. Uh, we can also mock free functions. So for example, if you're passing in some function, a boxed function, for example, for runtime polymorphism, you can pass that in as well. Um, you can generate something for that as well, sorry. So here we have mock func. We specify the actual mock object that stores all the bookkeeping, the actual function itself, which is just a closure, um, and then the return types and argument types and whatnot. And then you can specify, just like you would with the traits, um, behavior, it will return 10, and also specify how it was used. So say we had some function that we expected to call um, the, the function we pass in twice, then um, we say that it was called two times. So that's all well and good, um, but there's some serious disadvantages to mocking if you're not careful. So let's talk about another use case. So imagine we were trying to test how a robot makes decisions. So um, suppose that we have some robot logic, and this thing takes some world state. So it, ha it has some like, perception of, of what the world looks like. Um, and this is a value type, just a basic struct. And then we have a robot 
which takes some internal state and then decides what to do. And once it's decided, it acts on those decisions by, call it, by actually calling this actuator um, component here. So saying, um, I want to move forward or I want to speak. Um, in this case, suppose that we wanted to test this robot logic. This is a very complex logic, and it's the kind of thing that we want to poke and prod. So um, we want to mock the actuator in this case, because if this world state is just a simple value type, we can just construct that as a struct and just in, and have various different unit tests with various different world states. The robot um, is the complex hard part. And the actuator, if you imagine that this robot was, say, an entity in a video game or like a renderable entity or it was an actual physical set of hardware that you were sending orders to, um, obviously that's not very tractable to, mock, to, sorry, to test um, in an automated fashion. So we mock this out. Um, and again, if this actuator was, say, a trait, so for example, uh, it could have many actions, one of them being move forward. Um, this obviously it would realistically have lots more nuanced actions, but for the purposes of illustration, it has move forward and it moves by forward by some amount. We mock this as we did before. We use mock trait and then we do impulse actuator for mock actuator. The robot itself, in this case, takes a reference to the actuator and it has this take action function. Um, which receives some world state. Again, we don't care about the exact contents of it at this point, but just receives some world state, and then there's some business logic on, on how the robot decides what actions it should take. And this is the thing we want to test. Um, after we've done that, um, we can test the robot by, again, instantiating a mock actuator. Um, we run the code under test, which is take action, um, and then we assert on what actions the robot actually took. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, realistically, you would have many, many, many different test functions, all with different world states, all to test and poke and prod and, and test how this robot works. Um, now, the issue with this specific example is um, robots in particular and decision making is quite complicated um, and it's quite nuanced. Um, do we really care that the robot, in this case we're asserting, uh, do we, that the, the robot moved exactly 100 times? Is that something we actually care about? Do we care that it's moved forward a little bit? or within a range, we might not actually care that it's exactly 100 units. So if you imagine the space of all possible behavior that the robot can take, or the code of the test um, in a more generic fashion, um, and this is the expected um, behavior, what we've just done is we've tightened the, the assertion way too much. So now we've artificially constrained the test. So if someone decides to slightly change the implementation of the robot and how it makes decisions, so instead of moving 100, it moves uh, say 120, um, that might still be within our realm of expected, um, but uh, it will break the test because it's moved out of that tight assert asserted space. So what we really want is our expected and our asserted to be the same. So basically, behavior verification can overfit the implementation, and the lack of tooling and good ways of, of matching and argument values makes this more likely. So let's talk about pattern matching. So rather than match arguments to values, you match them to actual more generic patterns. So we have called with pattern. So you can say actuator.move forward called with pattern and you pass in some matching function. So here we have is greater than or equal to 100. This takes the argument being matched and then it runs some check, say r greater than or equals 100, returning true if the value is matched and false otherwise. Now obviously handwriting a bunch of closures all the time is probably not ideal. Um, it's very verbose and it's quite painful. So you get around this with parameterized matcher functions. So for example, you would have a greater than or equal to function. Um, this is a generic function um, that can take any type that implements partial EQ and partial ORD. In other words, any type that you can say greater than or equal on. Um, it takes a single parameter. The first argument is the, uh, the value being matched. And it takes a single parameter base val, which is actually what it does here, like what the base value should be. And so now, instead of actually generating, sorry, manually writing all of our matches, we can just use a macro called p, um, which is defined in double, to, um, to basically generate these matching closures for us. So this generates matching closures on the fly by you saying, take this parameterized match of GE and then 100. And so what this code looks like is pretty much the same. So we have PGE 100 and then matcher. And there's loads of built-in matches. There's wildcard matches if you don't care about specific arguments, comparisons, floating points, um, string matches, container matches. Um, you can also compose matches together. So you can say, maybe you don't care that the robot moved just a more than 100, but that it moved within some range. So you can say it matches all of greater than or equal to 100, lower than or equal to 200. 
Um, you can also, and this is a particularly useful feature, is do, is do matching across individual elements in a collection. So any iterable, uh, any iterable object, um, it, you can use this each matcher. So here we have some mock that records numbers or something. Uh, it takes a vector of integers, um, and you want to assert that this mock was called with a vector where each element matched this pattern, which is not equal to zero. And yeah. So you can also define custom matches. So design considerations. So there are two design goals in double, um, and this was Rust stable. Um, so Rust stable was a requirement, um, particularly for me because I was working on software that required Rust stable and not nightly. Um, and it's surprising how many mocking, uh, mocking frameworks out there always go with nightly. And it's because um, mocking and code generation um, is often a lot more convenient when you're using various nightly plugins and compiler plugins and whatnot. Um, for me, I didn't have that option, so I needed to go with something that could only use stable features. And the second one was no changes to production code. Now, it's okay to refactor your code to make it more testable, um, but uh, actually adding extra awkward boilerplate to the code just to make it testable always has just been a bit icky to me. Um, and also, at the same time, if you do that, that means you can't just mock any arbitrary trait. Like, you would have to rely on the library developer adding a certain annotation to a trait or a struct or a, or a function um, for you to be able to mock it. Um, so with this, you can actually mock any arbitrary trait from any library, and it doesn't matter. And these are challenging goals, um, again, because the, actually the, the original talk that I had was, uh, the second part of it was 20 minutes purely on why this was so challenging. Um, <laughs> But uh, sadly, we don't have time, but I would love to discuss it. Um, but basically, it's really, really difficult. And it's partly because um, Rust as a, as a compiler is so strict that it actually makes all this automatic code generation and generic mock functionality quite difficult. Um, one thing this was, quite, this was inspired by was Google Mock. So if any of you have used C++, um, Google Mock is an amazing mocking framework, but it cheats in some ways that the borrow checker catches, um, which is quite frustrating, but also a good thing as well. Um, so... As I mentioned, most mocking libraries require nightly, and pretty much all I found require production code changes. Like you at least have to annotate the traits that you want to mock. Um, but there is a cost to actually achieving those two goals, and that is the slightly more verbose um, generation. So as you saw earlier, there was two macros. There was mock trait and mock uh, method. Um, so you basically had to repeat yourself twice. Um, and there's, ve there's limitations in the current Rust stable version that basically make it impossible um, if you don't want any production code changes to, um, uh, to, to merge those two macros together. There's a specific feature I'm waiting for, which is um, uh, generic specialization, which will make this problem go away. Um, and uh, once that does, they can be merged. But until that point, it is slightly more verbose. Um, and that's pretty much the talk. Uh, to summarize, mocking is often used to isolate unit tests from external resources or large dependencies. And you can achieve, one way of achieving this in Rust is by replacing traits and functions. Um, however, using mocking um, can often overfit the implementation. So you need to be very, very careful. Um, and you need to have good tools that enable you to, to make these more nuanced assertions, not just you record with exactly this. You need to have these more looser assertions so that your developers don't hate their lives a year in the project and have to constantly change test code all the time when they slightly change the implementation. Um, Double is a crate that generates these, these traits and functions. There's a wide array of behaviors and setups. I only actually covered a very small subset of the overall set of features. Um, and it has first class match pattern matching support. That was the biggest reason I actually made this library was because um, pattern matching and Rust stable pretty much. Um, it requires no changes to production code, but that does come at a cost. These are some alternative mocking libraries that I recommend checking out um, after this talk. Um, depending on your use case, you might actually find these are, are, are a lot easier to use for you. So Mockers in particular is quite a good one. Um, here's a bunch of links. And that's it. Get in touch if you're interested or check out the double repo on GitHub if you want to contribute. <laughs> Questions? Everyone's ready for home? Cool. No worries, no worries.
thought. Thank you. I'm yeah, it was a bit concise, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a big fan of testing and mocking. Not general, because yeah. I do. Testing. Because in general, I do so like system programming, so it's like. Yeah. I mean, basically, you, see basically you started talking like if you do network or you know, whatever and files. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's no, I understand because like I think one of the reasons why like, mocking and testing is so big in dynamically type languages because you can't rely on the compiler at all, right? When you've got something like Rust yeah. and you're doing low-level systems, often you don't actually need to. I still, I still found even doing like quite low-level, at least with C plus anyway, I've still found that um, mocking has its uses, but definitely you can over, you can overuse it, right? So. I have one idea. Yeah. You say it's very verbose. You have to type all these yeah. things. You could have a external tool which could generate this for you. Yes, you could. You could do that. And then yeah. it still be in the stable. Yeah. Uh, um, the reason I decided not to go with that approach was because I. Just, I personally preferred the idea of having like an isolated library. Yeah. Uh, having to require the users to have like an extra step in their tool chain yeah, 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 was yeah, kind yeah. of, I don't know, for me it just kind of felt a bit awkward, you know what okay, I mean? Yeah. Um, but I understand. I think it'll become a lot more, um, a, lot, a lot better when, uh, when Rust macros 2.0 come out. Yeah, 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 so there's yeah. that and there's also, um, the actual reason why they can't be merged is because it, in, if you've got macros, you're, um, you're matching to the TY token. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're storing what you've been called with, you want to store the raw value type. So if you have, say, a reference to an integer. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so if you have, like, a reference to an integer, yeah. then um, you can't decay you that into just an integer. Okay. I want more stickers, yes.